Hey guys, before we start this review, I want to talk to you about Privacy.com. You can visit Privacy.com slash NerdSoup right now and get $5 off your first purchase. But before you do that, you want to know how it works, right? Privacy.com is dedicated to fighting credit card fraud by providing its customers with a new and easy way to shop online. With the holiday season right around the corner, you want to make sure your methods of shopping are secure. And that's where Privacy.com comes into play. Privacy has saved customers over 100 million in unwanted and unauthorized charges. I think we have all been the victim of credit card fraud at one point or another, and it's just a pain in the butt. Going through the process of reporting the fraud to your bank, waiting five to seven days for a new card in the mail, replacing that card number on all the websites you use to shop online, all of that can be avoided by using Privacy.com. But how does it work? Well, it's pretty straightforward. Say that you want to shop for some Criterion Blu-rays this November at Barnes & Noble. It's as simple as adding the product to your cart, in this case it's Tokyo Drifter by Japanese director Seijon Suzuki, and then using the Privacy Google Chrome extension to formulate a card specifically for that purchase. The best part is that the card is specifically formatted to only work for whatever company you are purchasing from at that moment, in this case, Barnes & Noble. So the card cannot be used for any other purchase on another site. You can make cards for virtually every major retailer online, and the cards are 100% secured. If some hacker tries to use that card for something else, it will be declined. So instead of using the same vulnerable credit card number everywhere you shop, you can use different cards for your different purchases. Now that may sound like a lot of work, but it's really not. The Google Chrome extension is really what makes this product so convenient. It allows your purchase to be made in a few clicks. The extension will generate a card for your specific purchase. It automatically puts the card number in. You click to confirm your purchase, and look at that. Barnes & Noble has accepted the card, and we've got ourselves a new movie to watch. Well, I do. Not you. Sorry. So if you go to privacy.com slash nerdsoup, that's P-R-I-V-A-C-Y dot com slash N-E-R-D-S-O-U-P, just in case you forgot how to spell, you will get $5 off your first purchase now. That's free money. Who the hell says no to free money? Money, 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 money. They say the best source of names. Any ideas? Oathkeeper. Game of Thrones Season 4, Episode 4. Oathkeeper? Can you name the character I'm referencing? The Hound? Great John. Umber. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll hang you as an Oathkeeper. Oathbreaker. Yeah, but... Can't tell me to fucking name someone who said a line if you don't even say the right line. I, I switched it because of the title of this episode. I get that now, but you're really not playing by the rules. Hey, give me the rule book. Give me that. Get this out of my sight. I don't want this. <laughs> this doesn't belong. You know, a lot of people were upset that I rapped on the last episode. Why? They're like, what is this rapping? Don't rap anymore. You're spitting fucking bars. <laughs> you think I should do some country? Let's find a hey, genre. Find a genre that looking. finally <laughs> I'm just going to do every genre. Going to hit every demographic. Next week, I'm just going to make electrical noises. Tell me in a week we get some uh, Kentucky bluegrass. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be ready to go. Get your banjo out. Hell yeah. Now, we've seen hints of this relationship throughout Season 3, throughout Season 4 so far, but it's the first intimate scene. Not necessarily an intimate scene, but it's Grey Worm and Masande learning more about their past and just kind of the similar past that they've traveled. They've both been slaves. They were both taken away from their family. So they do have a lot in common. Yeah, it's the beginning of a really nice relationship when you really think about it. It's easy to make fun of it, and the internet certainly does, but it's kind of beautiful in a way where she doesn't really care about him being a eunuch. It's more of just a relationship of character and of the mind. Reminds me a little bit of a, uh, this is weird that I'm referencing this again, Imitation Game. Okay. <laughs> Kira Knightley's character, she says she, he doesn't care about, about Alan Turing being gay, that we can be married with our minds. And I right. always love that. It's such a beautiful scene. And this kind of works the same way. She doesn't care about him not having his parts. She just right. loves him. The soldiers have nicknamed him Dick Fingers, so. Seriously? Yeah, and apparently he's got an eight-inch tongue, but I don't know about that yet. But one of the best scenes in season seven was Dude, that intimate- Pulling up like Venom. <laughs> <laughs> One of the best scenes in season seven was that moment that they shared together where they do have an intimate encounter without Grey Worm having those specific parts. But like you said, it didn't matter because they are truly in love at that point. And this is the relationship budding and 
it's just a nice English lesson that she's giving to him. Best teacher that you can have. Yeah, well, what does she have? How many languages does she have in her belt? I think 17. Damn. Yeah, 17. Yeah, speak to me in Dothraki. Yeah. <laughs> I won't understand it, but yeah, that's the point. It's also sad, too. He's talking about how he's always unsullied. Nothing before that he really remembers, or I don't know if it's suppressed or anything, but all this is all he known. It's, this is his whole life, and it's really sad. And she tries to bring his spirits up, saying maybe one day we'll go back to the Summer Isles and something along those lines. Just kind of reassuring him that he does have a purpose now, and that he always did have a purpose, that it's not his fault that he was taken away and mutilated and made into a soldier. But you could see that even though Grey Worm is a sensitive guy, he still is filled with hatred and rage for what the Masters did to him. That he does have a new purpose now to free more slaves, to fight for the queen that he believes in, to kill the Masters. And he's so emphatic when he tells her that. There is that rage and that anger that he harbors, and it comes out when he fights. Yeah, hell of a fighter. And Daenerys walks in on them and... Simple English lesson. We're not doing anything wrong. She's she's looking at him like, "Eh, what's what's going on here? And it's always nice to see Daenerys enjoying the company of people that she can trust and we get a couple of smiles on her face until she goes full crazy bananas (laughs) but she says it's time it's time to start the rebellion and this is another great scene where Grey Worm is infiltrating Marine and he gives this speech to the slaves of Marine but even before that the one slave that really becomes the spokesperson for them the way that he's trying to rile them up you could see how difficult it is when people have this slave mentality how how difficult it is to make them fight back. Yeah, I mean, it's the unknown. This is like much like Grey Worm. This is the only life they've ever known. So it's kind of, all right, risk your life for freedom or stay alive. And Grey Worm kind of reiterates that when he says that it, uh, one day as a free man is better than a lifetime of slavery or servitude, whatever he says. I'm not good at reading the subtitles. <laughs> yeah, and he comes, he brings the swords, and gets them going. It's... Right, and what we learned, too, with Daenerys' time in Marine is that it's so much more complex than slave and master. I think it's Barrison that tells her that people learn to love their chains, or it's Jorah. That some people, that their lives were good with their masters. Oh, yeah, we see that, too, later in the season when she's talking to the folk of Marine that come and said, Hey, I mean, I had a good life, I was teaching three meals a day, now there are no more masters to serve, I have no place in this world. Yeah, and it's easier, too, coming from Grey Worm because he knows a lot of their struggles. So they can relate to each other. And it's more impactful than if it was Jorah, let's say, saying one day free is better than a lifetime of servitude. This is Grey Worm. He was an unsullied. They don't play around. His whole life is just spent training. And they even say, we, what can we do? You've trained your whole life. We haven't. What, what can we do? But it shows that they outnumber them three to one and they have something to fight for. Right, exactly. And we see that scene, too, where they approach one of the masters and his guards leave him. And I love when he looks up on the Pyramid of Marine and he sees the flag of House Tar- Targaryen, the banner, and he knows that times are changing. And this is another kind of cinematic trope when you stumble upon three hallways and you look for one and people are coming, you look at the other, people are coming, you look at the <laughs> you call that a trope. I call it good planning on the part of the slaves. That is true. Yeah, we got a corner. By the way, they speak real good English. I mean, they can spell English pretty well, huh? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Where did they learn the common tongue? Yeah. Probably would have been better if it was in Valyrian, subtitled. Yeah, that would have made sense. But it is chilling when you see that. You see masters. The masters just saw that like, hmm, what do you think that says? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't speak the common tongue. Oh, no, we're fucked. Oh, look, <laughs> some of our slaves are coming for us. Oh, they're so nice. <laughs> they're always... oh, what do they have, steak knives? Oh, that's awesome. They're going to cook. I mentioned before, too, that I like when Daenerys is happy, that she's smiling, that she's walking around the city, and her subjects are beginning to call her Misa, like they did in Yunkai, that they're embracing her as a leader and as a mother figure. And to her, that fills her with pride. This is something that she's she set her goal on freeing as many people as she can. It's just not about conquering for her. It's about making lives better for her subjects. And that's a very noble ambition to have and rare in a leader. It's kind of a fault in later seasons too where she tries so hard to make everyone happy when in realization it's impossible and she has that struggle. But it just shows how kind she is to people that she has freed and want to be under her servitude and those who have wronged her, the complete opposite. As we see where, and deservedly so, she asks uh, Jorah how many bodies did they hang on the way to Marine, And then she does the same thing they did to the, the slaves, to the masters. Right, and this is where I was talking about that it's so much more complex. It's just not black and white, master and slave, that some of these people that were killed were probably against the killings of the children. And we learn about that too later in the season. But Daenerys, when you see something that brutal, when you see the torture and and death of these children, these innocent kids, it would be hard to stop that desire for justice, for revenge, because that's what it really feels like. And Barrison tries to warn her. And that look in Barrison's eyes, he's thinking, I know who her father was. I know what he was capable of. 
that well, even yeah. if she disobeys, not not disobeys, but even if she goes the other way, at least I spoke up. Yeah, he pleads to her to uh, treat injustice with mercy. I always like how they say justice on the show. I will answer injustice with justice. Justice, yeah. Justice. I, I guess well, it is. John justice, but you get, you get the idea. Right, in hindsight, it's a mistake, because maybe you want to vet these people, but <laughs> it's not really time for vetting when you, when you just see something that disturbing. They might not have been directly involved, but in a way allowed it to happen, too. So I don't right. think it's... It's also a sign that times are changing here. Crucifying children no longer flies in Marine. And like you said, that shot of the uh, Targaryen banner draped onto the harpy. It's a good fucking shot. Oh, yeah. You could tell that. Her time in Marine, I think, in season four is the strongest the arc is. For Daenerys? Yes. You're just getting all the complexities of being a ruler, how tough it is to rule an empire, essentially, like Marine. So funny, because in the books, that's the fucking most hated part of the story. I think only because it lasts a little too long. But No, no, I don't think it's her strongest. I'm saying of the Marine arc. Oh, okay, In season okay. four, the beginning is the strongest. Okay. But as it goes on, it, it, it weakens. Yeah. But that's the last we see of Daenerys in this episode, and it goes to Bronn and Jamie and their training. And Jamie is starting to get better with the left hand. Yeah, but the thing about Bronn, though, he doesn't fight fair. No, he doesn't. Bronn has this style where he's willing to do anything. He doesn't have honor like a knight would. Jamie compliments him and says, you're a rare talent, at least against a cripple. So even Jamie can see that Bronn is not a capable fighter, more than capable possibly even close to his level when he was in his prime. You could just see that Jamie's a natural, that he's going to pick this up a lot easier than others would. It's such a perfect pairing. Obviously, they made the decision to pair Bronn or Jamie, and this is kind of the beginning of it, but it kind of makes a lot of sense. Rather than him go with Lawless Stallworth and be on the outsides and barely even hearing about him, it gives him a prominent role with a prominent character. Right, exactly, and we love the relationship that Bronn and Tyrion had, and then it kind of shifts over to Bronn, and Jamie even has that line to him. is like, did you talk this way to my brother? Bronn's like, yeah, he got used to it. <laughs> James like, oh, Tyrion liked it, then I guess I can learn to like you too, Bronn. But the story, too, that Bronn tells him about how when he stood for Tyrion at his trial in the Vale, that Lady Aaron said the trial must happen today, before that, he named you to stand for him. That's, he knew that you would be willing to fight for him, and that just speaks to the bond that they have. Well, yeah, you can see right away, once he brings it up, Jamie kind of just gets up and walks away from the situation, but it kind of does, the words do hit him. He shows some guilt, and next thing he does is visit Tyrion. Because as we see in this scene, and we've got hints and a couple scenes before this, but it really just builds their relationship. I think the most in any other scene. Jamie notes that he hasn't visited Tyrion until he was arrested, so Tyrion can understand the complexity of the situation that he is being charged with regicide, killing the king, and Jamie himself is a kingslayer. So that's not a great look if he's going to visit his brother, even though you don't get that many scenes between them. But this season especially just strengthens that relationship, that brotherly bond that they do have. Yeah, it's a great dynamic here, and it just shows how much they care for each other. Like Tyrion, they're always joking around, and you could tell, like, and then that brotherly Jamie says, oh, Cersei's son died in her, her arms. He's like, oh, just her son? Yeah. <laughs> they can throw those jabs with each other. You could tell that they have a past, and they do love each other. They share that nice moment as well where Tyrion says, do you really think that I would kill your son? To which Jamie responds, do you really think I came here to kill my brother? Because he admits that Cersei asked him, to have Tyrion killed. Yeah, she might have mentioned something. <laughs> yeah, she might have mentioned that I should slit your throat. But it just goes back to Cersei having this just irrational hatred of Tyrion. Even though he loves Cersei, he loves his brother just as much. And it doesn't matter what anybody else that thinks, that is his brother. And he believes that he's innocent. Because obviously he is. <laughs> he yeah. even asks Bronn, do you think he did it? Bronn's like, eh, it's not much for poison. Or killing. Yeah. For that matter. The conversation then turns to Sansa, saying that Sansa is also on the run and that Cersei wants her head on a spike as well. Tyrion has a great line of foreshadowing where he says, Sansa's not a killer, at least not yet. And then it switches to the scene between her and Littlefinger. And this, to me, might be the best scene of the episode. Oh yeah, it's perfect. It's just... It's Sansa, you see her starting to pick up on things and Littlefinger trying to set seeds. She tries to gauge her intellect by saying, what do you think happened and why? It kind of turns into a lesson, that Littlefinger. Maybe his first lesson he gives to Sansa. Yeah, but Sansa too, seeing this transformation, it's her whole life she's been training to be a lady. So she's kind of had to repress these emotions that her wit, her intelligence, to see the world as it really is. But you could see that when she's pressed, when Littlefinger is kind of testing her, she's able to put the pieces together pretty brilliantly. Yeah. Um, she even impresses him when he says, maybe it was your lord husband. Sansa's like, no, it wasn't. And he's like, you right. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, like when he talks about when she asks uh, why betray the Lannisters, they gave you everything. It gives her a lesson about always keep your enemies confused. And I wish we got more of this, uh, watching some of these scenes, how he's giving these subtle hints. And she's being taught a lesson, even though she might not fully understand it yet. And I think it's just brilliant. It's just it sets up what could have been a terrific storyline in season five for these two characters at the Vale. Yeah, and she's mentioning all the things that he was given by the Lannisters for being loyal to them, but Littlefinger talks about how most men, they live their whole lives not wanting to risk what they have, or what they could potentially have, and he says that he's willing to risk everything because he wants everything. Yeah. And the way that this scene is written, the way that these lines are delivered by Aidan Gillen, who is just so good as this character, he's such a scheming little weasel, but that's why you like him. And he always reminds me of Land the Clever the founder of House Lannister, that there wasn't any reason why House Lannister should have usurped the Casterlies. But they did, because Lan the Clever was just so much smarter than everybody around him. And that's what I always get from Littlefinger. That's why you kind of root for him. Because in this feudal system, if somebody can come from the bottom and then make his way to the top by the end of it, to me, that's the game. Don't hate the player, hate the game. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think that's why people root for Littlefinger. Yeah, I have a lot of friends that are loved, that loved Littlefinger. <laughs> loved, right. Yeah. Well, Book readers, we still love him. Yeah, there's still hope for <laughs> he's him. He's getting that fucking throne. He's in the sitting book. on there. Even if he, he's like, he said fucking... once, if he sits on there for a second, he warns. Yes, just touches it. <laughs> just a little, little tap. Another great transition, too, to Olena and Marjorie. Yeah, he kind of alludes to Sansa, his new friendship, and how this would benefit him more than the previous engagement with Joffrey, because Joffrey's a bit of a loose cannon, never know what he's going to do. Transitions right to Olena and Marjorie. Yeah, and the Tyrells, it's a combination of predictability, so it's easier for Littlefinger to understand what their motivations are, and also power. That at this point, when you measure up the Tyrells and the Lannisters, you're kind of splitting hairs with their wealth. Olena is telling Marjorie that she's, it's her time to leave, because she doesn't want to stick around for this boring-ass trial. She probably should have. It's pretty entertaining. One of the best television. Right. <laughs> And she's giving some final words of advice to Marjorie, saying, listen, you're, you're in control now. Our legacy is kind of resting on your ability to manipulate this boy king. And yeah, she tells Marjorie about her skills of seduction, how she was supposed to marry a Targaryen. Good thing she didn't, because probably would have had her head on a spike. Yeah, good decision by her. <laughs> Olena's Mr. Steal Your Girl, son. <laughs> Steal your man. Steal your man. <laughs> she's like, oh, I crept into his bedroom and he couldn't walk the next morning. So he just broke his legs. <laughs> I crippled him. But he uh, encourages Marjorie to pay Tom in a visit. Right, yeah. She says, you're even better than I was. If you look back on old pictures of Diana Rigg, I believe her. <laughs> <laughs> I believe her. She seduced James Bond, so. Yeah, true. That's all you need. And we also have Elena alluding to Marjorie that she had a hand in killing to uh, Joffrey, almost a Tommen. And this goes back to the Littlefinger scene as well, where Sansa says, you probably had something to do with it. And Littlefinger says, I was miles away. I was in the veil. Vale. How could I have done that? It's like the Joker and... The Dark Knight wins. How could I have killed Rachel? I was in Gordon's cave. That's what you do. When, when you plan it well, then you're nowhere in sight. That's what Tyrion says, too. He said, if, if I would have planned the murder of Joffrey, I wouldn't have been sitting there, mouth agape, with my hand on the murder weapon. Unless you'd expect people to think that. Olena tells her, I would not let you marry that vicious beast. And it's going to be a lot easier to tame the younger one. And then it goes north, back to the wall. And my boy Locke... <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I thought about this scene is <laughs> Locke's just sitting in the background. <laughs> when the fuck did he get there? I'm just watching like, hey, it's Locke. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's Locke. <laughs> yeah, but he's training his uh, fellow brothers on the wildling fighting style. And right. He's two weapons instead of one, which if Jamie did that, maybe his left arm would have been a little better, but. That's where they should have sent him. Go fight with the wildlings. <laughs> yeah. You want a good teacher. Alice is such a prick, man. <laughs> it's like, oh, John's doing something that might help us in the coming war. Like, yeah, get out of here, you stupid steward. Forget that. Go, go that clean yet. a chamber pot. They like to act that they're beyond the politics of Westeros, but there's politics within the Night's Watch. And that scene with Jano Slint where he tells him, if Jon Snow, if there is a choosing, Jon Snow is going to win. And you're going to be taking orders from him for the rest of your life. But it's just Jon's natural leadership abilities that it's not about, let me teach you what I know. It's, this is what I have to do in order for us to survive. It's not him showing off. It's just, this is what we're facing. This is what we're going to face. And there was a great line by Pip, too, a couple of episodes ago that we forgot to mention that John Pip? says. Spin facts? It's so funny where he says, you know, if, if one of us, it won't be enough if each one of us kills a hundred wildlings. And Pip is like, I don't think I can kill a hundred wildlings. <laughs> so innocent. But even that scene with Ollie, this is, too, another relationship that I appreciated that they added in the show that I wish would have had a little bit more nuance, but that Ollie's willing to fight, that he wants to fight for the Night's Watch because of what happened with his family, but at the end of the day, he's still a child. Yeah. 
terrible child at that. Uh, well, here he's cool. Yeah, he's yeah. the best archer in his camp. Says who? You don't have any backup because because everyone in your camp is dead. We don't believe you. We need more people. <laughs> yeah. Over. No, no. Ali, well, actually, kid. technically, right now he is the best archer in his camp by default. <laughs> Technicality, but I'll allow it. Yeah, I'll give you that, Ali. And you see Locke befriend John, trying to get some more information about the whereabouts of Bran. Yeah, before he absolutely tap dances on that first guy. Yeah. Very John, underrated character. John's like, oh, you're, you're a trained fighter. You should go easy on him. Yeah, John, rewind to season one when you were yeah, doing the same were thing. beating the crap out of all these helpless boys. Well, it does show his maturation as a brother of the Night's Watch when he went yeah. from that to now he's helping. So it's a nice little ode to that original training sequence. Yeah, I think his character development, John, just to go on that, it gets a little underrated. Because he is very impulsive, he's very immature in the first season, even though he does have that Stark honor. But this is when he's becoming Ned Stark reincarnate, yeah. where he's taking on that leadership role. He's done trying to prove himself. Right, and I wish that in some other universe, John and Locke could be true friends, because <laughs> I kind of like them as a duo. Yeah, he's a nice guy right here. As soon as he finds his name, he says, you're highborn? Oh, I'm a bastard, my dad was highborn. Gotcha. Jon Snow, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and your crippled brother, too. And your cr- <laughs> I'd watch the Locke spinoff, man. Yeah. Just him... Who'd you cast as Young Locke? Young Locke? Ooh, that's, that's, that's a, a rap name. Timothy Chalamet? It was like one of those mumble rappers. Young Locke? Yeah. <laughs> Young Locke dropping an album. <laughs> and the formality between Cersei and Jamie just speaks to how their relationship has shifted in this season. That his return hasn't been happily accepted by Cersei because she's a lunatic. <laughs> and I know you love her, and I like her too. I enjoy the character. But I think this is the most I've ever hated her in this season because she is just so irrational throughout the whole season. I mean, she went through a lot. You know, her son died in her arms. It's, you know, it's getting colder. <laughs> it's getting colder. Yeah. Winter is coming, yeah. right? It's getting, putting on a little weight with the wine. Jamie kind of raped her. It's been a lot for her. <laughs> it's been a tough couple <laughs> yeah. of, yeah, I can see that. It's been tough for Jamie as well. A little tougher. But yeah, she gets into it with Jamie. She asks him, why did Catelyn let you free? Good question. Why the hell did this happen? Yeah. And he explains to her that, what, what, what did you want me to do? <laughs> Stay in chains? Like, yeah, she gave me an offer and I... I took it, and I was going to bring back Sansa and Arya for her. Well, he has that line, too, where Cersei accuses him, are you loyal to Catelyn Stark? Uh, Catelyn Stark is dead, Cersei. <laughs> it's like when people accuse presidents or leaders who are dead of crimes, and it's like, they're dead. So there's not much we can do about it anymore. And I'm here, I'm serving you, I'm still the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. What more do you want from me? I want you to find Sansa and kill her. Right, and kill her too, yes. I want you to kill two innocent people. Yeah, I think this is what kind of like spurs Jamie to send Brienne. I think he was going to anyway, but Cersei's talking about if I told you to go find Sansa and kill her and bring her back to bring her back her head or something like that, would you do it? And I think Jamie kind of realizes, and I thought this is one because in the books it happens much sooner when Jamie despises Cersei. In the show, it kind of drags out. I thought this might be like the beginning of that, but they kind of extend it throughout a few more seasons. So I don't know, but I think this is the moment Jamie's like, "Well, I got to send someone to protect Sansa because Cersei's going to stop at nothing to kill Tyrion and to kill Sansa." Right. They lean in it that he's eventually going to despise Cersei, but he never really does to the extent that he does in the novel. Because in the novel, he straight up just abandons her. He says, "You're on your own, kid. I'm going south or north. I'm I'm going somewhere. I'm getting the hell out of here." Um, yeah, I'd rather see. River Run. Right, I'd rather go you. talk to Blackfish than <laughs> conversate with you. Hello, when she sends him a letter, like, oh, I got arrested, please help me. It's like, eh. Yes, no, maybe. I'm going to go torment Edmure in a tent. Yeah, I'm going to go do that. <laughs> and Cersei's telling him that you need to put more guards outside of Tommen's door, but doesn't matter how many guards, because Marjorie's going to slip in. She takes the advice of Olena, and she starts working her magic on Tommen. And this is where Tommen realized that, oh my god, people of the opposite sex are awesome. <laughs> 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 this is great. <laughs> We went from, uh, my mom's not going to like this, to like, nah, stay between me and you. Yeah, but this is our little secret. Sir Pound's a real one, though. Oh, that's Sir Pound's? That's a great move, man. Was, you think he, like, trained him? Yo, hop on the bed, like, in the middle of the conversation. <laughs> yeah. when the conversation's getting a little dull. You hop up. My favorite, fa- like, not real theory is that Ned Stark warged into Sir Pound's. War- warged into Sir Pound's, yeah. <laughs> Become the true king of Whiskeros. <laughs> Ridiculous. But, but it is a great move. And, yeah, Marjorie's just playing this dude like a fiddle. So easy. Oh, yeah, it's, it's obviously easy. I think Joffrey was definitely more of a challenge. Um, this type of seduction kind of works on anyone, except Renly. <laughs> yeah, and she says, when, uh, when we marry, I become yours forever. Pretty good deal. So, yeah, I'll take that deal. You take that deal, Marjorie? Well, I already took it. I'd make that deal. Well, the way that she approaches him, too, where she gets really close to him and then goes for the kiss on the forehead. 
Great tease. Everything about this scene is just Marjorie working her magic where she talks about she's also planting the seeds of let's keep some secrets between me and you. Keep some secrets from your mother. At the end of the day, she still needs to get Cersei out of the picture. As long as she doesn't, he doesn't get mixed up with some religious fan- <laughs> fanatic, he should be fine. We talked about what led Jamie to make this decision to send Brienne off to find Sansa, and we see them here talking in the Kingsguard room. Is there an official name for that? Yeah, I think it's like the Oval of the Kingsguard or something like that. Yeah. The office. Who cares? The room. <laughs> with the big book where Brienne's reading all of his accomplishments and thinking, damn, you know, you need to get your weight up. <laughs> You're overrated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That does bother him, I feel like. He talks about how the acting Lord Commander writes the achievements of the men of the King's Guard. Like we said before, Sir Duncan got a couple pages. Yeah, oh yeah. He got like a paragraph on a good day. Yeah, Jamie's got an intro. <laughs> this scene between them, as you could see that the bond that they've created, it does go, I think it goes beyond platonic respect. I think at this point, Brienne probably does have feelings for Jamie that she's in love with this complicated man who tried to do the right thing, did the right thing, and then became a pariah by society. I think they both give great subtle performances here, especially Gwendolyn Christie. You could see like she's, you know, she's starting to stay strong. She has this demeanor about her where, you know, nothing really affects her, but you can tell that she's a little, she's a little saddened by this moment. He gives her oath keeper to protect her vows to Catelyn Stark to protect Sansa. Yeah, and he says you'll be defending the Stark girl with their father's sword except you won't tell him that you have the sword in later seasons right and i hope she does <laughs> but it is a great and i always say i think brienne is the best casting i think that's i, I don't know how they found gwendolyn and christy what she did before the show but it, it's such perfect casting and like you said the expressions that they give each other where brienne says i'll find sansa for catelyn and also for you yeah and jamie at that point he kind of loosens up and thinks well, he wants it too at this point yes exactly and that's why he's just such a deliciously complex character there's just so much going on inside that man's head. Deliciously complex. Deliciously complex. He gives her a bundle of gifts, you get a nice sword, you get some nice armor, and you get Podrick. The funniest transition of Game of Thrones of all time. That smile on that man's face. He's pumped. Perfect pairing, too. Good odd couple. And it gets criticized in the books as well, but I love her travels in the books. I love her travels in the show until she's staring at a fucking candle for half a season. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a good pairing. He's so honored to have that axe. <laughs> It's the legendary axe of Tyrion Lannister. To him, that's his oath keeper right there. Oh yeah, hell yeah. That Tyrion was nice with that axe though, man. Shot that dude's leg clean off. Oh yeah. Oh shit, I forgot about that. Yeah. But even Jamie knows the reputation of Podrick. He probably talked to Tyrion about this. I hear he's the greatest squire of all time. Is that true? Yeah. He's the goat. And we were talking about the farewell between Pod and Tyrion last episode, and this is another heartbroken, because they don't know if they're ever going to see each other again. At this point, they mean so much to each other. I mean, she was one of the catalysts in Jamie having this big character transition into being a likable character. And Brienne really found she was lost. She had nobody, and she found a friend in probably the most unlikely scenario in Jamie. Yeah, and we'll probably touch on it again. The Lady Stoneheart storyline being excluded from the show. Nah. I always do that. (laughs) This is the season. Yeah, it's going to be season eight finale. Be like, we might see her. (laughs) She might show up. The way that they reunite them in season six, that's a great scene as well. At this point, like you mentioned, they don't know if they are going to see each other again. And what they do in the book, it does kind of bring it back to where Brienne is destined, becomes destined to reunite with Jamie for reasons that are not so great. Back of the Night's Watch, this is another nice callback to season one where Sam is telling John that he wants to go and protect Gilly because he learns about the wildling raids. He, re- he learns how dangerous the North has become. And John is telling him, you stop me from riding south in season one. I'm stopping you now. Yeah, he starts second and guessing his decisions. He's like, oh, well, you were telling me the wildlings are raiding villages towards their way to the wall, and Gilly's a Molestown. They can't afford to do anything about it right now. They can't leave Castle Black except to go to Crash's Keep because that actually has some strategic value to it. Right now, you kind of just hope for the best. Right, I think that goes back to the vows, too, that that's why you don't take any wives. That's why you're not supposed to have relationships with women because it clouds your judgment. And it's not, it's not to say that going to protect Gilly is not the right thing to do. In the grand scheme of things, they need to protect the wall. Yeah, we learn here that John does know about Bran. Uh, Samwell, not great at keeping secrets. So he knows he's trying to map out where he could have went, what wildling village. And he says all the wildlings went to Manstrader, so everything's abandoned, and they land on Crasser's Keep where he could have passed by. Does he know about Bran going north in the book? I don't think so. No, yeah. I I thought Bran told Sam not to tell him. I don't think he says that in the show, right? I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure in the book he tells him. He makes him swear, don't tell my brother. Maybe in the show, too, but I don't know if he actually... Yeah, I don't. Even, I mean, we just reviewed it too, <laughs> but I don't remember. There's so many scenes, so many words. Yeah, can only remember so many lines. Yeah, but with John, it's obviously he's going to be concerned with Bran knowing a crippled boy is north of the wall, and that's why their 
reunion in Season 8 is so anticipated, I think, not as much as him and Arya, but because of what they both know and the information that they're going to be able to share with each other and how valuable Bran is going to be to Jon because Jon is going to believe him right away that he has these abilities and he's going to take full advantage of Professor X coming back home. Yeah, and you see uh, Locke creeping around a corner. He's heard all this information. He's like, hmm, I guess I'll go with you to Crasher's Keep. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> and this is what Slint kind of tells him to do earlier. He's like, hey, we need to get John out of the picture. So why not let him go? Yeah, send him on a suicide mission. But yeah, the speech that he gives, too, that is, it's just not about killing these men because they know how the wall works. They know the defenses. They know the true numbers. It's about avenging a man that John saw as a father. Yeah. That Gior Mormon, the way that he died... And it happens so much in this show, it happens so much in the real world, that he didn't deserve that type of death. Such an honorable man. It's about bringing these fuckers to justice. Good speech. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm... I do the quick little, eh, it might stand up. But, like, once Lock and he has enough, like, oh, man, I was, I was oh, coming I was next. Gonna, what do you, how much do you need? Pip's oh, looking okay. around. He's like, uh, I don't want to be an eighth wheel. Yeah. You, know, you guys oh, got I'm that. useless. Yeah, it's a magnificent seven. You know, just doesn't work with eight. <laughs> but every time John gives a speech, I'm so ready to scrap. I remember when I heard the hard home speech... And I watch it with Stu, and Stu was getting so riled up. That's a speech. Ooh, I can't fucking wait for that episode. Yeah, but he gets a nice little squad together. He does. You got uh, Gren, Ed, a couple guys we don't know. <laughs> Did Pip stand up? No. No, he didn't, right? No. <laughs> fucking, he's got to work on his uh, got, like, crossbow. Knights, Night's Watch member number 12. Right. Yeah, a couple of red shirts. You always <laughs> need the red shirts. And Locke. He sees his opportunity, even though it's like, yeah, I'll fucking say the vows. Let's do this. And who are they all going to? Yeah, it would be so fucking funny if he did all this, joined the Night's Watch, did his mission, killed Bran, killed John, returned to Ruiz Bolton, and he beheads him as a deserter. <laughs> <laughs> he said the vows. <laughs> and they got one badass motherfucker waiting for them at Crasser's Keep. Carl fucking Tanner. Drinking wine out of the skull of Gior fucking Mormont. Oh, he's the best. <laughs> So over the fucking top. I love it. Dude, I think he is, his name is Burn Gorham, and he's been in a lot of different things. He was in um, Pacific Dark Rim, Rises. Dark Knight Rises. He was also in uh, Crimson Peak, Guillermo del Toro movie. I think he's such an underrated actor. I wish he was in more stuff. He'd be a great Joker. He's got one of the best faces. He's got a lot of face stuff going on. You know, <laughs> he's a very sharp face, a lot of edges, these great facial expressions, these grimaces, these growls. He, he's such a great presence on screen. For as short a time as we see him, I think he, he just makes such an impact because he's a fucking legend. Guy lives in high school, though, man. <laughs> Got back in my day. <laughs> if it wasn't for my bum knee, yeah. <laughs> I'd be fucking sitting on the Iron Throne right now. <laughs> I could have went pro. <laughs> Any fucking night, you bring him to me. Hey, Raz, remember when I scored three touchdowns against our rival? <laughs> Dude, no one cares. We're 40. Yeah, we're, come on. <laughs> we're fucking north of the wall. We're in some keep with a bunch of... <laughs> What's football? It's always so disturbing to see this man's skull. That skull was once inside muscle and flesh. That like... was once the skull for Gio or Mormon. I feel like he might have had a bigger skull. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's... They probably measured it. Yeah? Yeah, they go for the realism on the show. Imagine drinking wine from somebody's skull, though can't be sanitary no the way that he's taking commands from him it's well, he's the lord commander after he, all Show right some right even though he's dead he still maintains his title <laughs> and i couldn't help but laugh during the scene it's, it's almost that laughing where you're laughing at a tarantino movie mm -hmm. where it's things that you sh that you shouldn't find funny but the way that he's holding his ear up to the skull what's that fuck them till they're dead yeah everything surrounding that too it's just so dark and miserable i mean you see the crafters wives are beaten and being raped by all these ex-members of the night's watch it's everything around carl tanner is just terrible it's a very controversial scene too it's very nihilistic and unsettling and disturbing because the way that they're going about this too is that the reactions on the women's face they they all seem dead inside that they've become so numb to the abuse that there is no fighting back and we kind of see that in the next episode when they make the decision to burn the keep why would we keep this up yeah we don't want to remember any of this and it, it's it's just that emptiness that they all feel it builds an atmosphere throughout this scene when one of craster's wives comes back with craster's last son this is where they're starting to get into the mythology of that hesitation too like oh it's a kill him bring him here then pulls the knife out right right dude and the way they all start chanting about the about the gods, the White Walkers, that they do consider them gods. And it goes back to there's, you know, great theories about what's going to happen, the true purpose of the, the others, that the expression, the others take you, let the others take you, that everybody uses in Westeros, but nobody knows where it originated from. This could be it. Yeah. The sacrificial babies that the others take that are given to them. Got that eerie, mysterious vibe to it. Yeah, and he's not taking any chances. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah, Rass, take, take the baby. <laughs> let Rass take it. And he kind of dresses 
down rest before and uh yeah, it's kinda, you're kind of like oh that's ah, fuck rest yeah fuck rest <laughs> you yeah. go from like oh that's mean to like oh yeah this fucking guy stinks <laughs> don't forget season two and the next scene right after this but we go to brandon and the crew and you can hear it. it's a chilling thing too because they're so close you can hear the baby crying in the background off in the distance and they say was that a fucking baby and brandon, this is so funny too because brandon works in the summer and he goes to investigate yeah. i can just picture uh summer just prancing around like oh shit ghost what up ghost? <laughs> and it's falling oh, down ghost ghost yeah hey <laughs> that's an m1 that's a flagrant foul yeah yeah, the way that Rass, too, the way that he's torturing Ghost, just makes me so upset. There's nothing that I hate more than when you tease an animal for food and then don't give it to him. Just breaks my fucking heart. You yeah. give that fucking dog some water. Give him a treat. You don't have any milk bones. <laughs> Rast also, he also delivers the baby, and this is where you can hear the ravens, the crows chirping, and the wind changing, and the way that they have that shot of the ice, the water becoming ice. Yeah. You just know the White Walkers are coming. And we'll get to that, because that's the final scene of the episode. But yeah, then Bran, Mira, Jojen, Hodor, they go to investigate what's happening at Craster's Keep. And at first they think, oh, it's it's the Night's Watch. They said, fuck the baby. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. They straight up did, too. I Because I kind of forgot about that. I was like, eh, yeah, fuck that baby. We need to get Summer. Yeah, fuck the baby. Let's go check out Craster's Keep. To be fair, Summer's more valuable than the fucking baby. <laughs> Yeah, and they fucking get caught. You think Bran and that White Walker are going to see each other in season eight? Be like, you fucking left me out there. <laughs> you think I don't remember that? Look at me. Look, Look at what I've become. <laughs> yeah, they get caught. You didn't see that one coming, Jojen, huh? Eh, maybe it was all part of the plan. <laughs> well, you just love when Jojen doesn't see something coming, huh? <laughs> Getting a little pretentious for you? Well, you know, you claim to be this knowing what's happened and seeing the future. Give us a heads up every once in a while. And you were saying how you were angry at Rass for picking on ghosts. This pisses me off, too, when they're all circling around Hodor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was so sad. I was going to say that's the first scene that pissed me off. This is the second one, too, because Hodor is just so sweet. Yeah. Gentle Hodor. Yeah, he wouldn't hurt a fly. And Rass says to him, I was like, oh, if I was your size, I would be king of the world or something. Yeah. He's another one. He's like, yeah, if I was 6'4", I could have made it to the league. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could have been in the league. Well, people always used to say that to me, like, oh, if I was as tall as you. I was like, yeah, you'd be uncoordinated as fuck. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that's what it's like to be as tall as me. <laughs> well, this too, the way that Carl Tanner is interrogating the whole crew, to me, it's also one of the most disturbing scenes in film is that opening scene from A Clockwork Orange when they're torturing that woman and the husband is watching. There's nothing that disturbs me more in cinema than a helpless person being tortured. And you think at first this is where the scene is going to go. Like, oh my gosh, what are they going to do to Mira? That would just completely break me because she's another one. She's one of my, I think, one of the most underappreciated characters on the show. But Car Carl Tanner realizes that he just came into some good fortune. He's got a fucking star hostage. Yeah. It's not bad. And Jojen pulls a Larry David and fakes, fakes a seizure. I, I guess, yeah. Was he faking it? No. He but fake the foam? I don't think he could fake the foam. You can't fake the foam. That'd be hell of a, it's a good job yeah, acting. Get an Oscar, yeah. <laughs> he did that. They he all kinda... just start giving him a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he has one of his attacks, and, you know, Bran, he has to tell him. Speaks to his character, he wouldn't let anything happen to Mira or Jojen. And he tells him he's Bran Stark, which kind of saves him, too. Because if you kind of don't tell him what they want to hear, or if they find out you're not some something of value, they'll just kill you. Right, like he says, that they're just more mouths to feed. And I guess from, the, from Carl's perspective, the curiosity factor, what the fuck are they doing north of the Wall? Yeah. These highborn lords, are they just exploring? How the fuck did they get past the Wall? It's, it's a mystery for him that he's not going to be able to solve, because he doesn't have that much time left. I mean, the final scene of this episode. It's, we're just pulling back that curtain ever so slightly, showing us the true threat and the purpose of giving them these babies. It's even a surprise to book readers, too. You never really get this far north, and you don't see them. There is no Night's King. It's, well, there is, but different. Night's Night. Yeah, uh, fuck that. They really couldn't have just made it the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, just, because it's just enough. Not enough to know the mystique and the lore behind them, but it builds so much theories that we still don't even know about today. Like you said, where are the other White Walkers? What happens when they turn the baby into one? Do they grow older? Or are they just automatically, they just pop up and they're one of these fucking guys? And you see them all in the background. Every time you only see, like, the four or three night, uh, White Walkers roaming around, you're like, oh, wait, you go back to this scene, there are... 13. You know, we'll stop, we'll circle them. There has to be more, too. How many sons of Craster have? How 99. many sacrifices? Yeah, so it just builds a lot of questions, and I can just only imagine watching that. Well, well the first time I saw it, too, yeah. I was just stunned because they use them so sparingly, the yeah. White Walkers. And I think that's, to me, that's the perfect way to build this threat because it is very ominous. It's like Tyrion says, they're the ominous they. The questions, too, about this, this ice palace that they have, where are they living? Is there a civilization there? Do they have communication? What? What are they doing? 
What is the point? What is the true purpose of them? It's just that perfect tease of the Night King coming up for the first time. And I like this design way more than the design that they've been using lately, this actor. Um, when he picks up that baby and he's got that little flicker of his eye where he winks at him and he touches him and that eye becomes blue. It's the uh, the blue eye of the giant that they're all living in. <laughs> That's what it looks like. Wow, could be. Yeah, right? And yeah, I mean, the fucking Night King, huh? Where, where, where the hell did this guy come from? Right, right. That's something, too. I like when the show does that. It's something where book readers and show readers have something, show readers, show watchers have in common where they don't know anything. They can't look it up or spoil or say anything. You can have your theories, but it's just something new. It's like when Jojen, when he didn't know everything that was coming. Yeah. The book readers finally got one over. Well, the <laughs> show the show watchers. Like, yeah. Oh, can you can you explain this? Oh, you don't know? Oh, this is in the books? I was going to say, too, like, just imagine watching this for the first time and maybe, like, trying to find answers and, like, oh, no, we, we don't know what's going on here. And that makes me think, too, because they're very much still adapting book number three at this point. Yeah. So it's maybe D&D just skipped a couple of pages ahead in their outline and said, we know what George is going. We know where he's going with this. Let's give the show watchers a little taste Yeah. that I wish George would do more often in the book. I wish he would just release the book. <laughs> yeah, it's such a great ending. The the music, the atmosphere, the literal chilly atmosphere. It's cool, too, when you see Bran's first vision where it's kind of just a flash and you see this face. And now you kind of get more insight to who that is where I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not sure if a lot of people actually caught that when it first happened. It kind of just flashed by. Yeah. And you kind of get that payoff, like where you can kind of start dissecting Brand's vision, seeing, oh, this came true, this happened, this happened, and building theories that way. It's just one of the strong parts of the show. They give you little hints, and they let your mind run wild with different theories. And we're still waiting for, you know, we got a little little more of a payoff, especially with Hard Home and Season 7, but you're still waiting for the actual reasoning or if they're ever going to give it or they're just going to leave it vague. You don't know. Yeah, we've got a couple months to wait, but hopefully those questions will be answered in Season 8. But this episode overall, to me, I I have to give it another 10. I'm just, I'm on the train of, the show is just perfect for me for the first four seasons, and this is just one of their better episodes. Giving out 10s, like, they're going out of style. You get a 10. You pretty, get a pretty 10. Soon, Everybody gets 10. 10's going to be... Wor- you ever hear of inflation? You're inflating the 10s. We're going to raise interest on the 10s. <laughs> you like the boy The economy's cri- good right now. We're the middle season four. Boy who cried 10. This is the golden age of you're Game gonna, of Thrones. You're going to call a 10 now <laughs> for an episode that doesn't deserve it and no one's going to believe you. In season five when it's... <laughs> When the show crashes. You're gonna no, you're gonna say hard home. You're gonna be like, oh, that's a ten. People are like, no, eh, no. It's like I, th- I think it's a ten, but this guy gives a ten to everything, so it must not be. There are different levels of tens. You don't understand the nuances of ten. So you're more of an action guy. It's fine. I like the dialogue and the action, and I've given dialogue heavy episodes a ten, and I didn't even get my score yet. So what, what do you, what do you think? Why are you assuming? What's your score? Nine and a half. <laughs> Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.